I'm going to talk about an ancient group of uh, fossil plankton, and it represents actually the first abundant uh, preservation of zooplankton in the fossil record. And this is a nice specimen here of one of these fossils, a uh, specimen of something we call a graptolite. And uh, this one is actually the skeleton's been replaced by um, iron sulfide or pyrite uh, or fool's gold. And when my student saw this, he goes, wow, Batman. So these are the fossils that we'll be talking about. I'm going to first take you back in time. And um, we're going to go back quite a ways into what's called the Paleozoic era, uh, which ranged from uh, 542 to 251 million years ago. And we're going to be looking actually at a geologic time period within the Paleozoic called the Ordovician period. And um, that's the early part of the Paleozoic era. So we're going to go back quite a ways in life's history. And um, we're going to look at this record of, of fossil zooplankton within the Ordovician time period. And the first thing is that the world was a much different place during the Ordovician time period. Um, the continents were completely different. They were um, drifting around, and they were in a much different place than they are today. And so there were no glaciers on Earth, except at the very end of the Ordovician period. And um, sea level was much higher, and so many of the continents were flooded, like Paleo-North America. And this is a reconstruction of what Ohio looked like during this time period, during the Ordovician. It was covered by a shallow sea, and it was warm and teeming with mostly marine invertebrate life. And so we had these kind of squid-like animals, and we had snails and corals and trilobites and clams and brachiopods. And Dayton actually is famous for its um, fossil fauna. So if you go just south of Dayton, uh, the rocks are just chock full of the fossils of these organisms. They were very happy in this warm, uh, well-oxygenated ocean. And also in those oceans, although not swimming but free-floating, were zooplankton. And these things that I work on are called graptolites. They're kind of small and millimeter scale things. These are scanning electron microscope pictures of graptolites. And um, they were colonial organisms. Uh, so you see that there are a number of little tubes here that are attached to this one colony. And each tube housed a little zoid. Um, and these are some growth stages of these uh, things that we call graptolites. So they were marine, free-floating organisms. Um, what exactly are they? Um, so they were colonial uh, organisms that flourished in the early Paleozoic, approximately 488 to 360 million years ago. They're hemichordates, and they're most closely related to a group of organisms that, that exist today um, called terebranchs, and in particular something called rhabdopleura. And these are pictures of rhabdopleura. Um, and so they have a little zoid coming out of each one of these little tubes, and um, there's a little disc with a proboscis here that they can secrete their skeleton with. And these are sort of encroaching tubes that branch off one another and are connected by a stalk. So these exist today. And nobody has actually ever seen soft tissue in a graptolite, in an ancient graptolite. And so we, um, our relationships are based, or our understanding of the relationships between rhabdopleura and graptolites is based on skeletal structure mostly. The skeletons are built of these little half rings that we call fuseli. And this is a picture of the fuseli here. And then they're kind of, um, they're bandaged over by a series of these cortical bandages. And, and it's exactly the same scalar structure as we have in rhabdopleurids. And so that's basically how we understand the, the evolutionary relationship between the graptolites and, and other hemichordates. Um, so this is actually one that you can find around the Dayton area. You can, this was isolated by dissolving limestone. The skeleton's made of protein, and it, it um, doesn't dissolve in the limestone as the rock dissolves around it. And this is an artist's reconstruction of what then the graptolite zoids looked like in the little skeleton. So here's the actual fossil, and this is the artist's reconstruction. And, and graptolites, although they're small and, um, I mean, they're, they're not, they don't, you know, not as spectacular as dinosaurs, of course, um, they are, are noteworthy fossils for a couple of reasons. First is that they're textbook examples of evolutionary trends in the fossil record. Over geologic time, they show a lot of directional shape change. And because of that shape change, um, they're very good at telling the age of rocks within that time period of about 488 to 360 million years ago. So if you can identify the shape, right, if you can identify the species of graptolite, you can put the rocks that you collected it from in, in sequence. You can get a relative age on those rocks quite precisely, much more precisely than a radiometric date. So they've been very useful for correlating rock units ar around the world. And so, um, you know, if an oil company wants to know the age of a particular rock that happens to have a graptolite in it, we can give them a pretty precise age on that rock. So they've been quite useful uh, fossils. 
But what I want to talk about today is not their distribution in time as much as their distribution in space. So I want to talk about their biogeography. And in particular, I want to talk about a couple of examples where we think that looking at their distribution in space can give us some information, um, important information about Earth history. And so I want to give you two examples of some things that we've done recently looking at, at graptolite distribution. Um, one is to try and understand the relationship between climate, their biogeography, and extinction. Okay? And the second would be looking at, at species and time and place do taxa with larger geographic ranges have longer durations in Earth history? And that might give us some information about what types of things are likely to uh, survive an extinction event. So you might recall that a, a couple moments ago I said that the Ordovician time period was a great hothouse in Earth history, probably the greatest hothouse in Earth history actually. But as we approach the end of the Ordovician period, somewhere about 444 million years ago or so, um, Climate changes dramatically. It cools. And accompanying that cooling is a massive southern hemisphere glaciation. And we have lots of evidence for this. That is. So what this diagram is showing you, here is where we have our, our basic climate crash, this little time period called the Hernantian. And you have um, four really large, big groups of graptolites that are very diverse before that time period. They dominate all of these faunas, hundreds and hundreds of different species. And then this one kind of really minor group that's very low diversity um, and uh, just kind of sort of barely hanging on for most of the Ordovician. Then we come into this big change in climate and all four of these groups begin to wane dramatically and eventually become completely extinct at the end of the Ordovician period. But this one group called Normalograptus, um, it's a genus of, of uh, at first very few species but then it radiates dramatically. Um, after these things become extinct, this goes on to become a large group, and all of the graptolites that exist into the next geologic time periods um, are descended from this one group. So there's an enormous mass extinction among all marine fauna at this time. In fact, it's the second biggest mass extinction in Earth history at the end of the Ordovician period. Um, and among graptolites as well, all of the major groups except one become extinct, and this one makes it through the extinction event and then radiates outward. So there is a biogeographic component to this extinction. Normalograptus, the one that makes it through the extinction event, generally um, is abundant or more abundant at high latitudes. And it seems to invade the tropics. It comes from the southern high latitudes. It invades the tropics. And while the other things are becoming extinct, it radiates and becomes the major uh, graptolite clade. But before this sort of broad story of extinction and radiation, nobody has really looked into what the distribution of Normalograptus was like in, in any detail. So to try and understand its biogeography and, and the nuances of this biogeographic component to extinction. For our first example, the methodology is we compiled a matrix of localities by time for every single Normalograptus species that's known from the published literature. We divided up the sort of middle and late Ordovician geologic time scale into equal intervals of a little bit more than a million years. And we counted every Normalograptus species from every locality that, it, that was in one of those time intervals. We re-examined all the scrappy specimens, which might have been called something, but really wasn't that. So, you know, fossils sometimes aren't preserved very well. And so we looked at every questionable specimen to make sure it really was a Normalograptus. Um, and then we studied the biogeographic patterns of this genus looking at using a, a program called PaleoGIS, which is Paleogeographic Information Systems. And so for us, a good absence means where we, where we think that, that the, the species never actually lived there was if you have a dark gray box here, meaning there's a good graptolite fauna, but it does not include Normalograptus. Now, this is really not good enough for us, actually. So we, we did this in some initial work. What we want to do next is something called ecological niche modeling, which is we want to find the places that have these species, or a particular species, and record all of the environmental characteristics um, as, as preserved in the rocks um, that that species is associated with, both other, other fossil faunas as well as lithologic characteristics of the rock, right? Can we get something about depth, oxid physical and, and, and chemical parameters of the seawater from the rocks, and then we will build a model using that data that we can use to predict if a locality does not have this species, but it has all of these other environmental parameters, we're going to say it actually did occur there. And so that's something that's called ecological niche modeling, and it's done fairly often in, um, in ecology. So we're going to extend this into the fossil record. 
uh, hopefully successfully. So one of the things I'll point out here is we did this data quality and you can notice this sort of low diversity and then an absence here. And these are both tropical localities in the Ordovician. Actually, Scotland was part of North America at that time. Um, and then all of a sudden there's this big diversification in low latitudes of Normalograptus. Okay, now quickly back to, um, to GIS, which is Geographic Information Systems. So Paleo GIS will take a modern map with localities on it and it will rotate those localities back to their latitudes and longitudes in the geologic past and then plot them on what we call a paleogeographic map. So using a variety of different types of data that, that many, many geologists have accumulated, okay, we try and figure out where the continents used to be and then we're going to rotate these positions back. So this is a map of the Ordovician uh, somewhere around, let's say, 450 million years ago. So in summary, Low diversity everywhere. You'll notice there really aren't any continental masses in the northern hemisphere really at this time. Okay, so low diversity everywhere. Complete disappearance from the tropics during this what we think is a warm period. And then all of a sudden climate cools dramatically and these normalograptids then uh, migrate back in in great numbers into the paleotropics. And then there's a mass extinction of all other graptolites. So some conclusions for our, our, both our examples. Um, one is biogeography plays an important role in the evolutionary dynamics of organisms. New quantitative techniques such as paleo-GIS help uh, paleontologists study biogeography in the fossil record. It's not something that has been done particularly often. Um, changing climate and its effect on ocean structure exerts, exerts a strong influence on the biogeography of marine zooplankton. Uh, geographic range size of graptolites is positively correlated with species longevity and larger range we think may provide a buffer to extinction when environmental conditions change. So if you have a large range and climate starts deteriorating or some way that's detrimental to the species, um, then maybe the, the populations that are existing on the margins of the range that are not changing so dramatically may persist. And finally, that deep time perspectives on climate change and faunal response may help us understand or predict the response of modern zooplankton, which are an integral part of the food web, uh, to global climate change that's occurring today. Thank you.